you have your Bibles, please turn, if you can, to Zechariah chapter 10. And as you're turning there, I want you to be thinking about counterfeits. Counterfeiting has been around forever. It's been around forever with currency and money. Uh, but more recently, it's become very commonplace with products. And I'm going to give you a, a list of a few products, some name brands that we all recognize. And counterfeiting is prominent with these brands. Ray-Ban sunglasses, Rolex watches, Louis Vuitton handbags, and Nike shoes. Those are all products that uh, there are plenty of knockoffs that are made of those. One of the biggest markets and biggest areas where counterfeit is in place is in high-end electronic parts and electronic devices. And it's estimated that 15% of all electronic parts that are purchased by the Pentagon for their devices are counterfeit. All of these counterfeits have one thing in common, and that is that they don't deliver the same way that the genuine article does. They don't provide the same quality. They don't provide the same reliability. They don't provide the same performance. They are nothing like the genuine article. I want you to hold that idea of counterfeit in your mind as we consider again where we are. And we ask ourselves as we look at chapter 10, why are we in chapter 10? When you browse chapter 10, you see a lot of the same things that you've seen earlier in this book. You've seen God's promises for future Israel, and you've seen God's judgment of the wicked. You see God's strengthening of the people themselves. We've seen all of this before. So why is this chapter here? I want us to remember again that the last part of this book has two oracles or two burdens. And the first burden is in chapters 9 through 11, and that covers the time of the Gentiles, which is from the return from Jewish exile in Babylon through the intertestamental period, through the ministry of Christ into the church age and up to the end of the church age. Chapters 12 through 14 deal with the time of the Jews. It's the time after God raptures the church out of this world and he fulfills his promises to the Jews primarily during the seven-year tribulation period. But in chapter 9 last week, we looked at how it was that God was dealing with the Jews and we looked at the end and the means and how it was that God not only could declare the end, but he would declare how it would get to the end, how he would get there. And we learned that human conquerors were simply instruments in his hand, particularly the pagan instrument, Alexander the Great. Prophecies that Zechariah made in 480 BC were fulfilled precisely, exactly, specifically, 150 years later in the person of Alexander. That's important because our culture says, we don't believe that God is real. And because I don't believe that God is real, I don't believe that God is working in this world. But when you look at scripture and you look at human history and you hold up human history together with scripture and you acknowledge someone like Alexander and all of the things that took place and you notice that those things are prophesied beforehand, you must conclude, you can only conclude that God is at work. So the world is full of counterfeits. Counterfeit shoes, counterfeit purses, counterfeit electronic parts. But this world also has counterfeit shepherds. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Because God is at work, and he is at work, and he is aiming towards his millennial kingdom, he has one and only one ruler in that kingdom. And we know that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the message of chapter 10 is accept no substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives this message to the Jew, and we see that in chapter 10. We'll see it again in chapter 11 next week. But he also gives that message to the Gentiles. He says to the Gentile, when you put your joy, and when you put your satisfaction and your contentment in something other than Christ, what that is, is that's denying that Christ is the true shepherd. So what we want to do today is we want to look at two ways in which we can secure Christ as the true shepherd in our lives. And the first way is to know the, the superiority of Christ. The second way is to know other things about Christ, namely his sufficiency. So we've got the superiority of Christ, 
and the sufficiency of Christ that are in view. So when you think about the superiority of Christ, God starts in verse 1 of chapter 10 by telling us to seek him. The way you start to understand the superiority and the supremacy of Christ is to seek God. But it's helpful to read the ending verse of chapter 9 before we read chapter 10. You can see in verse 17 of chapter 9 that grain will make the choice men flourish and new wine the virgins. God is speaking of the millennial kingdom in Israel. A large part of Israel is barren land, especially in the southern Negev region. You can go there today and it is hot and it is arid and it is dusty and it is the last place that you would believe that there is going to be new wine that is growing there. And uh, you, it's the last place to, for you to believe that men would flourish there. But it will happen, and we see the reason why in verse 1. God says, Ask for rain from Yahweh at the time of the late rain. Yahweh who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain, the plant in the field to each man. Now the key to understanding this verse is to understand that rain is a very common occurrence. God is saying, seek me in the normal the everyday, the routine, the mundane things of life. Seek me in the regular things of life. Ask for rain. Now, everywhere except here, it rains all the time. (laughs) So we have to ask for rain because it doesn't happen much. But God is saying in places where it rains, ask for the rain. He's not saying ask for a downpour. He's saying ask for the amount that is sufficient to grow the crops that you need. He speaks of the late rain here. And what he's talking about is the springtime later in the growing season for those people in that culture, in that context. It's the final nourishment for the crops before the harvest. The early rain is in the fall, and that's what's sufficient to get the plants up and running. And then the late rain is in the spring before the harvest. And God is saying, ask for that. And he tells us why we need to ask for this. And that's because only Yahweh himself possesses the ability to bring that rain upon request. He is the only one who can do this. We read this verse, it tells us, God makes the storm clouds. Yahweh is the maker of the clouds that produce the rain. And we know more today about how those those rain clouds come about with temperature and with pressure and all kinds of other atmospherics. But nonetheless, Zechariah was spot on here. God is the one who makes the clouds. And the verb makes there is in participial form. And what that is telling us is it's an ongoing activity. God has always made the clouds. He does make the clouds now. He will make the clouds in the future. He says that next. He will give them showers. And he's pointing ahead to the future, to those mighty men and the choice virgins. He's saying he will provide the rain for them in that time as well. The perfect amount for growing crops, the crops that they need. So this is the true character of the true sustainer in your life. And this is essential for us understanding the supremacy of Christ is that God, who controls all things in all time, is eager to give exactly what people need. So ask for it. And to seek God is to acknowledge your own insufficiency in things. It's to acknowledge that you're dependent upon him, even in the regular, mundane, everything of your life. And that's the right mindset for anybody wishing to align themselves with the shepherd is to recognize your dependence on God. So seek God. There's an application for us before we get into our passage deeper here, and that is that we need to cultivate an awareness of our dependence upon God. We have a lot of things in our lives that are big things, and we're pretty good at depending on God in those big things. Something big comes up, we got to pray. First thing we do is we sit down and pray, and we open our Bibles, and we read and see what to do, and and friends gather around us, and, and it's really great. And uh, I see that happening at this church all the time. That has happened in in great degree in this church in the last month or two. We have come together around people who are in times of need, and it has been wonderful to watch. But we want to think about the little things, where every bit is dependent upon God in the little things as we are in the big things. You think about something simple like buying gas. I need to go down and get some gas real quick so we can go where we're going. Think about all that's entailed in the gas, in the purchase of gasoline. God has to actually produce the raw materials beneath the surface of this earth. Those materials need to be extracted. They need to be refined. They need to be prepared and produced and delivered to the station so that we can can purchase them. 
There's all kinds of economics. There's all kinds of politics involved in it. There's God's provision to us to even be able to afford it. What I'm not putting on us here is some big burden we need to do every time we step up at the gas pump. But what I'm putting in front of us is the need we have to recognize our dependence upon God in all things. So whether it's gas or groceries or buying a new shirt, we need to remember our dependence on God, even in the little things, because that is the right mindset that will align us with the true shepherd, is to remember your dependence upon God. Now, historically, Israel was not at all inclined to seek after God. Instead, they sought after other leaders. And so with that backdrop in mind of God's perfect power and his provision, God reminds Judah of the false shepherds that they embraced in their past. And that's what you see in verses 2 and 3. So let's take a look at what God says about forsaking the false shepherd. You're going to want to forsake the false shepherd for two reasons. And the first reason is in verse 2, and that is that these false shepherds are empty. Forsake them because of their emptiness. So let's read verse 2. For the teraphim speak wickedness, and the diviners behold false visions, and they speak worthless dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people journey like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. Now, these, this word teraphim is speaking of a household idol. And this can be something that's very small, or it can be something that's more large. And uh, the small one you can see in your Old Testament when you remember the story of Jacob and his wife, Rachel, and she hid the household idol under the, the saddle of her camel in Genesis 31. That was one of the smaller teraphim that was hidden. It was small enough to hide under a, a saddle. We have an example of the larger ones in our Bibles as well. And that story is the story of King David before he was king. When Solomon was, oh, sorry, when Saul was pursuing him, uh, David's wife, Michael, hid the household idol on David's bed and put hair on it on the pillow. That was obviously a larger idol. So in that house, there was a larger idol. But whether they're, they're large or they're small, what it is, is it's an idol and it is inanimate. And God says these idols speak wickedness. Now, we know that the idols themselves don't actually articulate. They don't actually speak. But the demonic forces behind them do. That's what we need to be mindful of. And what they just speak is deceit and untruth. And it's usually something that leads into sin. So God speaks about these idols. And then he speaks about these diviners. And these are actually real people. These are people who practice divination. And what that is, is people who attempt to tell the future by interpreting natural events and dreams and things like that. So they see the weather, they see a storm, they see something else. They tell us that that is a portent of what's coming in the future. That's a diviner. God speaks of visions in a very right and good sense. We go all the way back to chapter 1, and we have eight visions. God gives Zechariah eight visions which talk about the future of Israel. and Every one of those is true. Every piece of it, every letter of it is true. But Zechariah here is speaking about how these diviners speak false visions. It's something entirely different than what God gives to Israel. Here, these, force, these false visions, what they foretell is untrue. It's unreliable. It is a lie. And it is something that is never really going to come to pass as a part of God's plan. And these diviners also speak worthless dreams. And again, in the Old Testament, God was speaking through many godly and holy men through dreams. And he accomplished his purpose and he used those dreams to reveal the future. But these are worthless dreams. These diviners are communicating worthless dreams. They're not dreams from God. They're devoid of truth. They're empty of promise. They're, they're the kind of thing that caused Israel literally just to be waiting on a lie. That's what they were doing. And these things provide their comfort in vain. They comfort in vain. So these people are attempting to bring comfort and solace and consolation and security to the people, but every attempt to do that is vain. And so the result is... After these, these diviners speak, there is no comfort, there's no encouragement, there's no solution to the problem. And this is a problem that's not really limited to Old Testament Judah. We see this around us all, all the time today. We see it in the prosperity gospel. 
The thing about the prosperity gospel is that it does not deliver because everything is focused on today. What's the title? Your best life now. The focus is on today. There's no hope for the future because the focus is entirely on today. Same thing is true with secular therapy. The aim is to help you feel good about yourself today. Just today. There's nothing about your readiness to meet your maker in the future and to solve your ultimate problem, which is your right relationship with God. And you can go on and on. There's others that are way too far invested into their career or their appearance or their accomplishments, believing that in those things you find security. Those things are false shepherds as well because those things are aiming at your success and your accomplishments today. They're not focused on the future in preparation for a right relationship with your maker. So the result of all of this is that you have people who are journeying like sheep. They're people who don't have any guidance. They're wandering. It's sheep without a shepherd. And they're afflicted. We need to understand here that this idol usage and listening to these, these diviners is not harmless. It's not the kind of thing where it's, it's a no-op. It doesn't actually matter. It's actually something that's very, very harmful to you. It imparts damage to the ones who listen to them. And the reason why is because they're not shepherds. There is no shepherd in the room when these people are speaking and when these idols are being bowed down to. The shepherd that would protect them, whether they were the priests or the religious leaders in Old Testament Israel, they were derelict in their duties. And so God says, forsake them because of their emptiness. But secondly, in verse 3, he says, forsake them because of the judgment that is coming upon them. Let's read verse 3 and see some of that. My anger burns against the shepherds, and I will visit punishment upon the male goats, for Yahweh has hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his splendid horse in battle. God is saying my anger burns against these false shepherds. God isn't indifferent to them. He is burning in anger against them, and he has exhausted his patience. He was done waiting for them to be faithful in their task. He's done. His anger is burning. So in the near context there, you have these Levite priests during the time of the conquest. They were not given any land as their inheritance. All the other tribes were given land. The tribe of Levi was distributed throughout the other tribes because their inheritance was the Lord himself. Uh, They were assigned towns. They were given towns in each one of the other tribal areas. And their main responsibility was to serve in the temple and to explain God's law to the people, and then to resolve conflicts and issues between the people by using that very same law. They were to be so skilled in the law that that it was able to resolve anything that they had. But instead, they began using their role for selfish gain, and they began to use their role to lead people astray. You see the term that is used here, God will visit punishment upon the male goats. This is a a broader term that extends beyond the religious leadership and anybody who is in a leadership position that God would give them. And God is going to visit punishment upon them, which means that God has a future judgment in store for them. So God is telling Judah, I do not want you to embrace false shepherds because I am going to judge them. Why would you follow these men when you know that my judgment is coming upon them? And I will judge them because of how they lead you. Yahweh of hosts has visited his flock. Now here God starts speaking to the future. And he uses that past tense again to talk about a future event that is as good as done. God will visit and he will attend Judah and he will make them like a splendid horse in battle. In the millennial kingdom, the men of Judah will be believers in the truth. And because of that, they will be able to lead Israel well in the truth. So the false shepherds provide this empty consolation and they're going to be judged because of that. So do not follow them. Judah needs a better shepherd than the false shepherds that that they were in their history. They needed a much, much better shepherd. They needed the Messiah. They needed the good shepherd. And that's what we see in verses four and five. And God tells them, treasure the true shepherd. And again, this is a time before Christ. And so they're looking forward but he's telling them about someone that is to come. And so he gives three descriptions of Christ, and then he gives one description of what Christ produces in men. 
And we see that in verse 4. Zechariah writes, From them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg, from them the bow of battle, and from them every good taskmaster, all of them together. You notice the reposition of the phrase, from them? We want to make sure we understand who them is here. It's his flock. It's the house of Judah that's being mentioned just before. The Messiah will come from Judah. God wants Israel to understand the one you are to treasure is the one who is coming from you. He's coming out of you. And that's the description of the Messiah. First of all, we see that he is Israel's foundation. You see how from them will come the cornerstone? The cornerstone is the stone that is essential to the construction of any building. It sets the line in three directions. It's usually in the corner of the building. So it sets the horizontal line, the length and the width, and it also sets the height. It's the most important stone in the building, in any building. And likewise, the Messiah is the most important person in all of Israel's history. He plays the most important role in Israel's history. So he alone supports the nation of Israel in the same way that the cornerstone sets and supports the building. So the Messiah who is from you will actually support you. So that's the first thing God wants Israel to know about the one that they are to treasure is that he will support you. He is your foundation. But then he tells them that the Messiah is also your glory. And you read that from you will come the tent peg. Now, when we normally think of a tent peg, we think of the thing that you drive into the ground to hold your tent into the ground so that it doesn't blow around in the wind. That's not the tent peg that's being used here. What I want us to think about is, is a round tent that has a center pole in the middle and a pole that goes all the way to the top. And the peg is something that the people would drive into that center pole and they would hang their most precious family possessions on that peg. So God is telling Judah, the most important thing is my glory. And the Messiah Jesus is the one who holds my glory. He possesses my glory. None of these false shepherds possess my glory. Messiah Jesus does. So not only is he their foundation and their glory, but he is also their, their power. And we see that because he is described as the bow of battle. It's the same word you see in verse 10 of chapter 9, where God says the bow of war will be cut off. The bow of war will be cut off. And what that means is that there is no other power in Israel. All other power will be done away with. The only one who will possess power will be the Messiah. So all power will belong to the Messiah. So God's telling Judah, in the future, there will be power, but there's only one who's going to hold that power, and that is going to be Messiah Jesus. So those are three descriptors of, of Messiah that God gives to Israel to help them treasure that Messiah. But then he tells them what that Messiah will raise up in the form of taskmasters. He talks about how every good taskmaster will come from them. Jesus himself is the perfect supervisor. We all know what a supervisor is. It's one who sits over and directs, and he raises up people underneath him to execute and to perform the tasks that need to be, be performed. I've had many supervisors in, in my life, and one of them is in this room, and he's a really sweet man, and I worked for him a long time ago, and he was a good supervisor. But Jesus is the best supervisor. The way we see that is that he raises up taskmasters who are just and mighty and powerful, all of them. Every single one that Jesus raises is a perfect good taskmaster. They're constructive in their oversight and their guidance, and all of that oversight and guidance is for Judah's good. It's for their good, and it's dispensed with dignity. Never again will Israel have a taskmaster that, that runs them into the ground. Israel will have a good taskmaster in their future. And you see how it says all of them together? This is speaking about all of their taskmasters. This won't be the general trend. Every single one that God enlists in his service in Israel will be a good taskmaster. That's what Messiah does. He raises up good taskmasters. So he's their foundation. He's their power. He's their glory. He raises up good taskmasters. Who wouldn't want a taskmaster? Who wouldn't want a shepherd like that? 
We read verse 5, what those taskmasters are capable of when they're raised up by the Messiah. They will be as mighty men. They will tread down the enemy in the mire of the streets in battle. They will battle for Yahweh, and Yahweh will be with them, and the riders on horses will be put to shame. So these are mighty men. Messiah is going to raise up mighty men. This is strong, decisive leadership. And this is very meaningful to Israel, because if you look at the last five kings who ruled Israel, Judah, before their exile into Babylon, you've got Jehoahaz, you've got Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. I guess that's four kings. If you look at all of those kings, they are weak kings. They are corrupt kings. They are blind kings. They have no zeal for the Lord. Israel's taskmasters are going to be the exact opposite of those kings. So when Israel thinks of their own history, they think of these, these poor leaders, weak, corrupt, no conviction, no zeal for the Lord. And God says, I'm going to raise up somebody different. Messiah Jesus will raise up people underneath him that are completely different from what you're familiar with in your own history. They will tread down the enemy. This is speaking of the ongoing decisive victory at Armageddon when Jesus comes and rescues his people. They will be done, this will be done in the mire of the streets. There is no honor and there is no dignity that's going to be extended to those that they defeat, the wicked enemy. They will do battle. They themselves are going to apply themselves in service to the Messiah. Think back to chapter 9, verse 15. Their, their garments are going to be drenched in blood, just like it is on the altar. These men are going to be engaged in battle. They're going to be fighting against all of those, those enemies who seek to annihilate and destroy and remove Israel from human history. But they're going to be so busy accomplishing their task that they are going to be drenched in blood. They're so dominant that riders on horses from the enemy are put to shame. Normally, the horse is an advantage in battle. It's an advantage for you over those who are on foot. And it's occasion for confidence. But here, what results for those enemies who are on horses is their own shame. What that tells us is that their defeat is going to be so convincing that an advantage, or what was an advantage, or was supposed to be an advantage, becomes a liability and a source of shame. So this is the Messiah. This is the shepherd that God tells Israel to treasure. And so there's a point of reflection for us. We, we can't miss this. And that question is, is Christ the ultimate satisfaction of your life? Do you find your ultimate joy in Christ? Or on the other hand, do you, do you passively acknowledge him, but find your true joy in something else? We have to ask ourselves that. And one way to discern this is when you obtain something that is the fruit of your labors, something that is good, something that is useful, something that helps you be a good instrument in God's hands. But at the same time, it's something that's, that's pretty cool. It's nice. It's really nice. What happens to your affections? Do your affections remain pointed at Christ? Or do your affections turn away from Christ and point at the new thing? The way that you can measure your affections is by what occupies your mind. When something nice comes into your life, are you thinking mostly about that thing or are you thinking about the giver of that thing? Are you thinking about the lordship of Christ in your life and how you can use that thing in your service to him? Pretty similar to what Jacob was talking about this morning in his second part of the theology of fun. So the summary here is that God knew Judah and he knew their affinity for their false shepherds. He knew that. And he knew that those shepherds would seduce them and would lead them astray. But God impresses upon Judah that their provision will always come from him. And Messiah Jesus is the true shepherd. So in order to forsake the false shepherds, you also have to know about the sufficiency of Christ. And that's the thing we want to look at in verses 6 through 12. And we're going to see that, that Christ provides three kind of deliverance here. And the first is a physical deliverance. And you see that in verses 6 and 7. He actually provides a physical deliverance. I'll read verse 6. 
God says, I will make the house of Judah mighty, and I will save the house of Judah, and I will cause them to return because I have compassion on them, and they will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am Yahweh, their God. I will answer them. Again, mighty Messiah will make them the house of Judah mighty itself. The house of Judah and the house of Joseph are both spoken here. And what we need to see there is this represents the totality, the reuniting of Israel. You have the, the northern and the southern kingdoms that were produced after Solomon's reign, where you had Jeroboam in the north and you had Rehoboam in the south, and it went downhill pretty fast for the northern kingdom. It took the southern kingdom a little longer, but they got to the same solution, the same end. It went downhill. They went into exile in Babylon, just like the northern kingdom went into exile. But God is saying here, I'm going to cause you to return from all of these different lands, and I'm going to cause all of you to return to the complete land area of Israel. You're going to come back physically from distant lands back to Jerusalem, and I'm going to cause you to come back spiritually to return to me because I will have compassion on you. And God says, they will be as though I had not rejected them. What that tells us is that Israel, when they return, they will bear no evidence. There will be no trace of God's judgment of them. There will be no evidence of God's discipline of them. There will be no evidence of God's rejection of them at all. You won't be able to see it by looking at them. And that is amazing. Do you want to know how great of a Messiah Jesus is? When he reconciles you to himself there is no evidence whatsoever of your former condition. This is the Messiah. You are a new creation in Christ. So what other master has that kind of heart for his people? You need to know that this is the master you need. This is what is so helpful for us. Let's keep reading in verse 7. Ephraim will be like a mighty man, and their heart will be glad as if from wine. Indeed, their children will see it and be glad. Their heart will rejoice in Yahweh. So Messiah bestows upon Ephraim, which is another word for the northern kingdom. He bestows upon them might. Therefore, they will have joy at a heart level. That's the joy that only comes through regeneration. Joy at a heart level. It's not an outward joy. It's not a fleeting joy. It is a permanent joy that originates in the heart. And then notice what he says about the children. The children will see it and be glad. This means children are going to observe the regeneration of the adults. They're going to observe the joy of these mighty men. And because of that, they will possess that same inner joy. And this is astounding. This is how comprehensive God's deliverance will be. To get our minds around that, just think about a large group of children. When was the last time you saw a large group of children and every one of them was regenerate? Every one of them believed. Every one of them was full of joy in Christ at a heart level. This is impressive for us. Messiah is a spiritual deliverer. That is the kind of Messiah that God is telling them about. He's speaking of a spiritual deliverance in verses 8 and 9, and we see that there. Let's read verse 8 and see that in addition to being a physical deliverer, he will be a spiritual deliverer. In verse 8, I will whistle for them to gather them together, for I have redeemed them, and they will be as numerous as they were before. This tells us that Messiah himself is going to summon Israel to himself. But here's where you see the distinction between the true shepherd and the counterfeit shepherd is that he says, I have redeemed them. This again is another example of speaking in the future about speaking in the past about something that will take place in the future to help us understand that it is as good as done. But he says, I have redeemed them. And to redeem again is to purchase away from the power of another by the payment of a price. What price? The price is the Messiah's own life. So Messiah Jesus is willing to give his life to purchase the people away from the false shepherds who will destroy them. That's how good of a Messiah he is. And you see the obvious contrast here between the false shepherds and the true shepherds. 
The false shepherd never gives his life to another because the false shepherd is in it for himself. He's not in it for those he wants to lead. And God says, I will sow them among the peoples and they will remember me in far countries and they with their children will live and turn back. God says he will sow them. He does not say I will scatter them and just fling them. He says, I will sow them. That's to plant them with care. The same way you plant a seed, I will plant them with care so that the gospel can be planted in their hearts and they will remember me God remembers his promise to Israel and they will remember him. And so what is the result? The result is they with their children will live and turn back. Believing Israel will return to the promised land along with their children, those who are redeemed in the same way that they are. So Messiah is telling Israel, I can save you physically and I can save you spiritually but also I can save you permanently. This is what they need to understand. I can save you permanently. You need to know the sufficiency of Christ is in his permanent deliverance. And that's what you see in verses 10 through 12. And as we read this, notice where Israel comes from and where they end up. And this is going to help us understand just how massive the return is going to be. There are going to be so many people, they won't fit into the land area. Verse 10, I will cause them to return from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no room can be found for them. So we see Egypt and Assyria there. Those are godless nations. Those are nations that had afflicted Israel in the past. They enslaved them. They carried them away in exile. God is saying, I will bring these people back. But look where they will come back to. They will come back to Gilead, which is east of the Jordan River. And they will come back to Lebanon, which is north of the promised land. God's message is, I will redeem so many of you from that sowing that I do, that you won't be able to fit into the promised land and you'll be overflowing into the neighboring regions. There will be so many of you. Verse 11, they will pass through the sea of distress And he will strike the waves in the sea so that all the depths of the Nile will dry up. And the pride of Assyria will be brought down and the scepter of Egypt will depart. So the idea in verse 11 is that God is going before them to remove every single obstacle in their return. Their return will literally be smooth sailing. He's doing this geographically in the seas and the river. He says the Nile will dry up. But he's also doing this politically in the nations. He's saying the pride of Assyria will be brought down. This nation that was so proud when they carried you into exile. I am going to humble them as their captives walk away from them and walk right into their own promised land. God tells them the scepter of Egypt will depart. The scepter is a symbol of authority. If a guy is on a throne, he's holding a scepter and that says, I am the one in authority here. And God is saying that will depart from Egypt. This is one of the oldest nations in the world. It is still in place today. And God is saying one day they will lose their authority. So God has caused them to return by humbling the nations where they were held captive. It's important for us to know that. But we see the permanence of this in the last verse in our chapter. This is so sweet for us. God says, I will make them mighty in Yahweh and in his name they will walk, declares Yahweh. Now we've seen this again and again throughout the book. but We need to not miss what God is saying here. God gives them might in himself and they will walk in his name. And what's in view here is perpetuity, an ongoing walk in his name. It's a walking in his name that will have no end. God is saying to them, You have returned to Yahweh and you are mighty and you will never need another deliverer. So this is a permanent deliverance. If you want the best life you can have, then don't run after a substitute. In Old Testament Judah, there were many, many false shepherds leading up into the exile into Babylon and Judah followed after them and they got hurt. 
They believed them, they believed their message, they believed their false visions and their false dreams, and they got hurt. Jerusalem was burned, the temple was destroyed, they were carried away into exile. Nebuchadnezzar took away all of the valuable articles in the temple, he robbed the temple. It was a very bad experience for Judah. They put their confidence in false shepherds and it just didn't work out for them. The same thing was true in the New Testament times. Israel also went after false shepherds. Those were the Pharisees and they were the Sadducees. They were the religious leaders who cozied up to Rome that made agreements and arrangements with Rome for favor. But in doing that, they, they subjected the people. They didn't lead the people in holiness. They didn't lead the people towards Christ. They didn't lead people to love God's word. They gave them something else. They layered something else on top of God's word. I want us to read what Jesus said about these men. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 10. Let's read verses 11 through 14. This helps us understand the severity of these shepherds, how bad they really were. And we see a contrast between those shepherds and Jesus himself. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. Because he is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. The religious leaders of Jesus' day said, follow us. Get behind us as we walk down the street. Follow us. Line up behind us. That'll be good for you. But Jesus is saying, these men are not concerned about you. They will flee when they see the wolf coming. And the wolf is the opposition to the truth. Jesus says, I am such a good shepherd that I will purchase you away from the wolf. And I will purchase you away from him. And I will make you permanently mine by laying down my life for you. So in Jesus' time, Israel was surrounded by false shepherds. And Jesus says, none of them compare to me. I am the good shepherd. And notice how he says, I am the good shepherd. He does not say, I am a good shepherd. He uses the definite article. The definite article is there in the Greek so that you can know that there is one and there is only one good shepherd. Next week, we're going to walk through Zechariah's prophecy of what Israel would do after he told them about this good shepherd that is coming. We're going to see what they would do to their Messiah, the prophecy about what they would do to their Messiah during his first appearance. But before we close, let's think of one application for us here as we read this. As you read all about Christ's supremacy, read all about Christ's sufficiency, his superiority, all of these things, The application is this, express your delight in Christ's sufficiency. If you have a prayer life that needs to be a little bit more robust, you look at your prayer life and you say, I need to grow my prayer life. One way to do that is to express your delight in Christ and his sufficiency for you. If you are a believer, recognize that you used to live in a spiritual wasteland, but God reconciled you to himself through his son. Fill your prayer life with gratitude for God because of what he did in giving you a savior. Marvel at his control over human history to arrange all of the circumstances and all of the people and all of the situations that he would bring the gospel message to you. And marvel at the fact that on one particular day, he would make you able to see with clarity what you could never see, what you were blind to seeing before. Grow your affection and your delight in Christ's sufficiency. Think about how you do that. You just remember and review all that God has done for you. Think about Christ's service in your place at the cross. Think about the totality of your sin from when you were very, very young until today. And think about how Christ bore all of that in his body on the cross. Think about how he suffered the Father's wrath for you so that you would never suffer one drop of it yourself. And then at conversion, he would actually take up residence in your heart and he would dwell within you for the rest of your life. And then think about his daily care for you as one of his sheep. 
He is a good shepherd. He is a much better shepherd than we are over ourselves. It's very helpful to remember what he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4. He is a shepherd who can sympathize with our weakness. Yet in every one of the occasions that he entered into, he was without sin. He really does understand our circumstances. He really does understand our problems. He was a man just like us, and he lived around sinners just like we do. But his life is the perfect example for us of how to navigate the situations that bring to us. In Matthew chapter 4, you have the temptation of Jesus. Satan brings him three different temptations. And in every single one, how does he respond? He responds with scripture. He goes back to Deuteronomy and he goes back to the Psalms. This is how we can follow Christ. This is how we can cherish and prize Christ. And know that he is such a good savior that when you stumble into sin and you fall on your face, it does not change your relationship with you. God is able to save permanently. His deliverance of you is permanent. By his grace, you have the ability to get up the next day and walk forward in newness of life by his grace. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this picture of your son. I thank you that he is a superior shepherd and he is a sufficient shepherd. I thank you for the the distinction between him and every other shepherd. There is no comparison to him. I pray for us as a church and that we would be people who grow and grow and grow in our affections and our allegiance to him because of who he is to us. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Amen.